Yes, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion on uh, SML. This is part two in, in our discussion of this uh, uh, typed functional programming language. And we start with the map function. Recall from our discussion on uh, scheme that we, all, we have already discussed this important function uh, remember, <coughs> uh, map uh, takes two arguments, uh, a function f and a list, and applies the function to every item in the list. So the implementation of map that is shown here is use, uses cases and patterns. Uh, that was one of the possible uh, programming techniques that uh, we discussed uh, in previous lecture. So here we're saying that one possible case is that um, the list that comes in is empty. So the empty list here is a pattern and if that's the case we return the empty list. Recall that the purpose of the map function is to uh, return a list. So in the case we have an empty list then we cannot apply the function to any item, so we just return uh, the empty list. Uh, if that's not the case, then we have another case here, which is which uses the pattern a double colon y. So a here is the hat, and y is the tail. And what do we return in that case? Well, we construct a list by using the cons operator. Double colon is the cons operator in, in standard ML. And we first uh, apply the function to the head of the list. f of a gives us the result of applying f to the head. And we cons that to the result of applying map again to the same function f and the tail. So, viewing it this way, we are uh, applying the function to every item in the list and we are constructing a list which contains the result. And this is uh, exactly the same, of course, the, the same uh, method of solution that we covered when we were talking about uh, scheme, the map function in scheme. Uh, and notice that the map is a, is a built-in function so, if I start up uh, SML, then I should be able to apply map to some functions and some lists. Uh, let me first define a function successor, which takes one argument and returns uh, the argument incremented by one. And let me also define the function square, which takes one argument, let me call it x here, and returns x squared. And if I have these two functions, then I can apply the function successor to each element in the list 1, 2, 3. So map, I'm calling the map function, which is built in, which takes two arguments, the function f and the list 1, 2, 3. And what do I get back? The list 2, 3, 4, because I'm applying the successor function to each element in the list. One successor of 1 is 2, successor of 2 is 3, successor of 3 is 4. And notice that the result is, is uh, compiled into a list. Now if we do map square, of the same list, I get 1, 4, 9, because square, square of 1 is 1, square of 2 is 4, and square of 3 is 9. Uh, we, in our earlier lecture, we had the, we wrote the function first, and let me just uh, write that again, we have the function first, which took a pair of, which took a pair as an argument, and the pair consists of x and y, and it just returned x. It returns the first element. So, 
if I now do map first of 1, comma A and uh, 2, comma B and 3, comma C, then I get uh, the list 1, 2, 3. Notice first takes a pair, so when it takes the first, the header of the list, which is the pair 1a, it returns 1. Then it applies the function to the head of the tail, which is 2 and b, and returns 2. And finally, to the pair 3, comma c, and returns 3. And uh, the map function constructs a list out of the results, and that's how we get 1, 2, 3. And this is an integer list that we get back. Now, here's a question. How would you apply the square function to the first element of each pair in the list 1a, 2b, 3c? We need to apply the square function to the first element of each pair. Well, we already know that map first gives us the first element in gives a, gives us a list which consists of the first elements of the pairs in the, in the in this argument list so map first of 1 comma a 2 comma b 3 comma c gives us the list 1 2 3 so if if we want to apply map if we want to apply square to that result we can simply do map square of the result of doing map first and this list. And that gives us 149. So map first of the list gives us the list 1, 2, 3, and then we apply the function square to the result. So basically, we're doing map square of the list 1, 2, 3, which gives us 149. So uh, map is, uh, is quite an important function in, in, in functional uh, program languages. Applying a function to uh, a given list. Now let's take on another example here. Let's assume that uh, matrices are implemented as lists of lists. So in this particular example here, we have uh, x as a name, which is defined as a list of lists. So, so if I copy this definition for for the name x and I paste it into the environment, into the interpreter, it tells me that x is indeed a list of integer lists. It's a list of integer lists. Notice that we have three individual integer lists in this overall list and so we can think of it as the first element in the list the header being the first row the second element being the second row and the third element being the third row basically viewing it like this 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4 is the first row, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4 is the second row, and 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, 4 is the third row. So if I do header of x, it gives me the first row, the basically the first list in this list of lists. Now what if I want the first column? If I want the first column, I basically want 11... 21 and 31. That's the element that I want. Well, once again, map becomes handy because if I apply map 
sorry, if I apply the header function to each element of the list, I'm basically asking for the header for the first element, the header for the second element, and the header for the third element. And that's exactly 11, 21, and 31. So I do map header of x gives me 11, 21, and 31. Applying the header function to each element of the list, where each element of the list is a list. Now, uh, recall from our original or first discussion on uh, functional programming languages, we were talking about lambda calculus. A lambda calculus is the theoretical foundation behind functional programming and uh, uh, the functions in lambda calculus are, un, uh, are nameless. We don't give them any names. And uh, we saw in Scheme that we were able to construct functions without names by using lambda and in ml we can use uh, we can do the same by using the keyword fn instead of uh, defining functions using the fun keyword f u n we use uh, the keyword fn so we have the keyword fn then uh, formal parameters and then a equal sign arrow and a body so this is the way to, to uh, define nameless functions. So for example, we can do the following. We can send into map a nameless function. This function here, what does this function do? Well, it takes a single argument x and returns uh, x times 2. So notice that I haven't given this function a name. I'm basically writing a function here on the fly and I want to apply this function to the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Again I'm using map. Map takes a function and a list. And what do I get back? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. No big surprise. Each element in this list uh, is used as an argument to the supplied function, the nameless function. So I get uh, 1 times 2, 2 times 2, 3 times 2, 4 times 2, and 5 times 2, and everything is, uh, and the, the overall result is, is a list of the results. Now, um, Let's look at some more functions here. Uh, one is uh, called uh, remove if, and this is uh, this is selective copying. What does this function do? It removes items from a list if a condition evaluates to true. So, for example, assume that I have this function odd odd x. Uh, odd takes a single argument x and what does it return? Well, it's supposed to return uh, true if x is odd. So the body of the function says uh, x mod 2 equal to 1. So if the remainder of by uh, after having divided by 2 is 1, then this function returns true. So if we write this function here, fun odd takes a single argument x and what does it return the result of this expression x mod 2 equal to 1 and notice what the interpreter gives back remember uh, ml always states what it is the type of the functions that we're defining so this is a function the odd is a is a, is a name uh, that stands for a function that maps an integer to a boolean. It maps an integer to a boolean. It makes sense because we are sending an integer in as, as an argument and what type of an, uh, what type do we get back? Well, boolean, either true or false. So what I want to be able to do uh, is to call a function called remove if 
and supplying it with another function which um, behaves like a filter. So if the result of applying that function to the arguments, its elements in a list, if it's true, then uh, we remove the element from the overall results, else the argument will be part of the results. So for example, in, in, in this uh, state, in this function called remove if odd and the list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then 0 will be sent to the odd function and we will get uh, f uh, false back because 0 is not odd and that 0 will be become part of our results. When we set, send 1 to the odd function, we will get true back, which means that 1 will not be part of the results, and so on. So this is the behavior that we want. And uh, let me actually see if I, if I have this function, if I have already programmed it. Yes, remove if is there. So that means I am able to load this function. Remember how we load a function into the interpreter? We supply it with a path. So in my case, it's called remove if.sml. And I close the quote. And here it is. It actually has the odd function as well. And uh, the remove if function and then another function called filter here. Um, now if I run remove if on the example that we had on the slide remove if odd uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Remove if odd 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I get 0, 2, 4 back, which is exactly what we wanted. I removed the elements from the list for which the supplied function returned true. That's really what we were asking for. Now, how is remove if uh, implemented? Well, as always, we need to identify the base case. We know that we are going to do a, a recursive solution, so we need a base case. What is the base case? Well, remove if takes a function and a list. Since it's taking a list, it's very likely, or it's, it's almost always the case, that uh, the empty list is part of the base case then. So, and again, we're using patterns here. The, we're using the cases and patterns. The first case is the base case. If the supplied list is the empty list, then we just remove the empty list, because then there is nothing to remove from. Else, the second case is the case where we have um, a list of the form hat and a tail. So we have A and we have as the as the hat and then we have y as the tail and we have f as the function so what do we do well if the result of calling the function f with the argument a which is the hat of the list if it's true then we simply call remove if again again with the function f but now with the tail so what have we actually done effectively we have just removed the hat element from the list because if the result of applying f of a is true then we should have removed it that's exactly what we wanted to do if the function call returns uh, true then we will remove the element from the list and effectively we remove it by just calling the function remove if again now with the tail now if f of a was false, we construct a new list 
which contains the element A as the head of the list. And what is the tail of the list? Well, it's the result of calling remove if again with, uh, with uh, uh, the tail as, a, as an argument. So, if we just look at this, if we trace it, it's always good to trace a, a, a function like this to be able to understand it uh, better, to be able to understand what's happening. And what, what was our test case here? It was this here. Remove if odd zero one two three four five. Now the base case is obviously not true because the, the list that we supplied is not empty. So then we send the header, which is our a element, at zero, to the function f to the odd function. Odd of zero is false. So the if part is false and the else part will be executed. What does the else part do? Well, it constructs a new list with zero as the header and then con, uh, cons, const with the result of doing remove if, again the odd function, and now the tail of the list. The tail of the list is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm basically just rewriting this expression here. So, what happens in the next step then? Well, the base case is not true. Uh, we supply the function odd with the head of the list, which is our a here. That's 1. And odd of 1 is true, which means that we will call remove if here. We'll call remove if now with the same function and the list 2, 3, 4, 5. Notice the tail of the list. In the next step, we send the 2 into the odd function, and f of 2 or odd of 2 is true, sorry, is false out of 2 is false, which means the else part will be executed, which will construct a new list with 2 as the header. And what is the tail? The result of doing room remove if for the list 3, 4, 5. And so on. In the next step, we will do the following. We will send 4, 5 into remove if, basically removing a uh, the odd value 3. Then in the next step after that, four will a list will be constructed which has 4 as its head and then we will be the tail is only the list 5 and when we send 5 into the odd function which is true we will do remove if of the empty list basically removing the value 5 and sorry what I uh, forgot to put here is the odd name of the function which is odd like this and uh, finally the base case kicks in because now we have an empty list and what do we return for that case? Well, we return the empty list. So after the last call, we will have the following. Uh, the empty list will be returned. And now the sequence of uh, recursive calls has ended and uh, the stack on the unwinding phase will start, meaning that we need to construct the results. So first, 4 will be 
a list will be constructed which has four as its head and uh, empty list as its tail. That means we have basically the list two and the list four. That will return re result in the list two comma four, which finally will be results in the list zero, two, and four. So this is this is the the way it it works if we trace it by hand, really. Now, um, we have been talking about earlier that uh, ML is strongly typed. But however, well, strongly typed, first of all, what does that mean? It means that all the types of the expressions and variables have to be uh, determined at compile time. There's no dynamic typing. The types are not deduced at runtime. It's clear when we write the expressions what the, the types of the expressions are. However, in many cases, the types do not need to be specified because there is a special functionality in ML which is called type inference. So the language can infer the types from the part of the expressions. So when we do something like 3 times 4, it gives us back 12, and not only 12, the interpreter tells us that this is an integer. And how does it know it's an integer? Because the individual values of the expression has integers. 3 and 4 are integers, and we're doing integer multiplication. And notice then when we defined the function successor, it told us that the this was a function that uh, maps an integer to an integer, even though we didn't specify that the formal parameter was integer. But the function was able to deduce this, uh, or inf the interpreter, I mean, it was able to, to infer this because we're doing uh, integer addition here. We're doing plus one, which means that n must be an integer. So the formal parameter is an integer, and we're mapping the result to an integer as well. If n is an integer, then n plus one is an integer. Uh, <clears throat> but what, uh, what types do we have in ML? Well, we can say that a type is a set of values and permitted operations on these values. This is just like a, an abstract data type is uh, an encapsulation of uh, some values, some data, and some operations on these values. So we can actually put forth a, a um, BNF form for the type expressions in uh, ML. So we can say that a type expression can be a type name this is a, uh, uh, the type name uh, is, is one of the basic types like integer, like uh, bool, like car. Or it can be a functional type. Uh, some type expression to another type expression. This is what we had here in the previous example from an integer to an integer. So this is a functional type. Or it can be what is called a product type. A product type, uh, some type star, some other type. And this is, for example, when we have a pair. Recall from our definition of the first function. Let me see where that is. Here fun first and then we supply it with a single argument which is a pair x comma y is equal to x notice what the interpreter told us about the type of the function it says that it is a, a product type where the first part of the product is a the second part is b so it's a pair and it result uh, return the the type a basically returning the type of the first element of the pair. So this is uh, called a product type in ML. And the third possibility is a list type. Uh, and we saw some examples of this that 
earlier where for example here when we defined the value x what did we get back we got back a list of integer lists and if you just make it a little bit simpler if I type in 1 2 3 what do I get back I get a list type back it's an integer list that I got back and this is what we have here we have some kind of a type expression that a type expression is could be a type name which could be a basic type which could then be for example the integer and then we have int list as one possible type so these this really enumerates so all the possibilities of the types in ml basic types functional types product types or list types And as we said earlier, product types are tuples. They are ordered pairs, where ordered pairs A comma B, where A is of type capital A and B is of type capital B. And one some example is this pair one. The num the, the integer one and the string one. What is this? This is a product pair, as you can see from the interpreter here int star string the first part of the product is int and the second part of the product is is string or the first part of the pair is int and the second part is string and we could have a tuple i could have a instead of having a pair i could have a three tuple so let's see i put in 3.0 here and now i have a three tuple where the first part contains an integer the second part a string and the third part a real and notice that the type inf inference function functionality is, is uh, doing the work here because we haven't specified any types uh, we haven't given uh, the programmer hasn't given any types explicitly Um, talking about giving implicit types, we sorry talking about giving explicit types, we have seen in our examples that there is no need to do that because of the type inference functionality. So when we looked at the function length, there is nothing here that states any types. We have cases. We have patterns here that when we have the empty list, we return zero. If we don't have an empty list, we have a list that contains of the hat and the tail. And in that case, we return one plus the length of the list. But the interpreter is able to deduce the types or infer the types. It says that this function is mapping a list type, a list of some type A, to an integer. Why to an integer? Well, because we're returning zero here, and we're returning one plus the length of something. One plus the length of something will give us integers. So it's clear to the uh, interpreter that the return value is an integer. Uh, it's also clear to the interpreter that the first argument, or the only argument, is, is a list. However, it doesn't know uh, what type of list it is. It could be an integer list, it could be a character list. And this is uh, this is the polymorphic nature of the language. I can supply length, assuming that length is a is a uh, built-in function. Let's check it out. Yes. Length of 1, 2, 3 is 3 and I supplied it with an integer list but presumably I can also do length of uh, 1, 0, 2, 0, and 3, 0. And I get back also 3, but in this case I supplied it with a real list. So in this sense, the length function here is polymorphic because it can take lists of arbitrary types. Similar in the f append function, we didn't uh, specify any type. And the append, when we type this into uh, the interpreter, it'll tell us that the it's mapping a pair 
notice here we have the product type. It's a pair of lists that we are mapping to a single list. Does, the make, does that make sense? Yes, we are uh, append takes two lists and appends uh, the second list to the former list. So it takes a pair of lists and returns a single list. And once again, it doesn't know what type, uh, what is the ele element type of the list. It just knows that it's a list of some type A, it says. But it, it says also, notice that uh, the, the, the element type of the first list must be the same as the element type of the second list. That's why here we have A here and A here. So in most cases, we, when we are defining function, defining functions, we are using uh, implicit typing. But sometimes we actually might need to uh, explicitly specify the types. So if in, in ML, if we do this, fn at x comma y is equal to x plus y. Now this works in ML even though we didn't uh, we didn't specify the types of the arguments, it tells us that it's a function that maps a pair of integers to an int. Why does that work? Because uh, integer is a default, it's a default value in SML. In some other M ML um, uh, implementations, this might not work because uh, we didn't specify the type, so the see, so uh, when ML is ML is trying to do is trying to apply the plus function, it doesn't know w which types are the arguments, the operands to the to the functions, to the to the op to the operation. But in, but for standard ML, this works because integers are default types. Now, if we would like to tell the interpreter that at actually should expect uh, real numbers but not integers we could say let me call it add two that it still expects a pair x y but that the return value should be a real now i'm telling the inter interpreter by using this colon here that the return value of the function should be a real value so if i do this it now tells me that the function expects a pair of reals and returns a real. Well, how does it know? It, it obviously knows that uh, it should return a real value because I told it so. And then it infers that since it returns a real value and since it's doing arithmetic plus, then the individual operands to the plus operation must be real as well because real plus real is the real. Type inference. Now, we mentioned uh, polymorphism, and we saw an example with the length function. And here is a simple function. If I define this function, I, function i of x, which is equal to x, uh, this is a kind of identity function. It takes any type A and returns the same type back. So if I do I of 3, I get 3 back. If I do I of 1, 2, 3, as, uh, of the list 1, 2, 3, I get the list 1, 2, 3 back. Or if I do I of John, I get John back. So this is an example again of a polymorphic functions, function because it can take any type as, a, as an argument. I supplied it with an integer, I supplied it with a list of integers, and I supplied it with a string. And we saw earlier this example with the length function, that, that one is also uh, polymorphic.